Okay, good morning everyone. I see lots of people are showing up in the live chat here. So Jenna and Cindy are here and Min and Anna. I don't think I know who Anna is off to the top of my head. Uh, Casey's here and I think that's Lily and Faye and Thee and uh, Lim is here, good, and Ella and Karen and Aliana and Mashid. Um, and Adalbert and Pearlie, good morning. Good morning, all of you. Um, how are you doing this morning? How are the classes going so far? Everybody good? Good morning, Caleb. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, Karen. Uh, eh. So far, so far, so average, Eliana, or what? Good morning, Michael. Yeah, well, <clears throat> we'll get there. It's always, you know, the first part's always difficult as we kind of get used to our new classes and our new teachers and uh, of course, we're getting used to this online thing, and I don't know about you guys, but coming out of coming out of vacation is always difficult for me to get moving again. I kind of lose my momentum, and then it's hard to um, it's hard to sort of get back to work. So, hey, good morning. That's uh, do 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 do. Same, yeah. I know how it is. I know how it is. Um, okay, so what we'll do today is we will, um, I'll walk you through kind of a very, just kind of the very ground level of some of the stuff that we'll be talking about um, in this course. Um, there's, from what I hear, there's still some um, there's still some people who are registering. Sorry, I'm just going to check something here. Um, there's still some people, some some students who are registering, and so uh, we might have a couple more people trickle into this class um, before the end of the day. So I don't want to jump too far ahead, but we do have some stuff we can talk about that is again at, at a very basic um, at a very basic level. So we'll start talking about that. Um, what was I gonna say? What was I gonna say? Oh yeah, um, so I'll put I'll put some lecture slides up on the screen, and then I'll kind of talk, so you'll be able to see the slides and hear me. There's a hey, good morning, Carmen. Um, there's a feature where we can set it up so that you can actually see my face and the slides at the same time. Um, but the software I'm using, I kind of forgot how to do it. <laughs> uh, I used to know a few a few weeks ago, and then I forgot. Um, so I'm just gonna have to relearn that for tomorrow. So today you won't be able to see me, uh, good morning, you won't be able to see me at the same time as the slides, but that's okay, you, that, we can do that. Um, so yeah, so maybe without further, without further delay, um, without further delay, I will put some slides up here. Um, so. Obviously, this course is called Comparative Cultures, and culture is what we'll be talking about. Um, most of us, I think, have a fairly intuitive grasp of what culture is. Um, all of us live within one. All of us have been taught culture. Um, and so, again, I think we have an, 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 blah, 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 sorry. We have an intuitive grasp of what culture is. Um, but of course, we're going to dig in a little more deeply um, within this class, looking at some ancient culture, some modern culture, and trying to understand more accurately what culture is and how it works. Um, so, let's say this. Pretend for a moment that I am an alien, okay? I've just arrived from outer space. I've never been to Earth before. Um, and I'm an alien. I've landed here. I've looked around this strange planet of yours. And I've seen all kinds of 
different living things, okay? There's things living in the ground and things living in the water and things flying through the air and there's weird green things that seem to be alive everywhere. There's all kinds of life forms on this planet. Uh, they're very diverse. They're very, um, they're, they're all over the place. But you creatures, you humans seem to be pretty significantly different from all the other creatures on this planet. And so as an alien, if I asked you, what, what is a human? Good morning. Um, if if I asked you what what is a human, what would you tell me? And so in the 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 live chat or the comments, type in some ideas. What makes humans so different from other creatures? Why are you guys so different from all the other living creatures that are on that are on this planet? What do you think? So different about you guys what's unique what's unique about humans hmm. yeah Ella says we yeah you use tools yeah that's that's something that um, isn't unique to humans there's a few select animals that do use tools um, but certainly no animals use the wide variety of tools and use um, tools to the degree that all of us do, right? And again, a tool can be something as simple as a fork or a knife or a chopstick or a brush, all the way to a computer, right? We use all kinds of different tools. Some of them are simple, some of them are complicated, um, but that's certainly something that um, humans do almost exclusively. Uh, humans can think very carefully before they do things. Yeah, that's very, that's very true. Um, although sometimes we don't, right? Sometimes, uh, sometimes us humans do things and they should think more carefully about what they do before they do, before they do something. But it's true, right? Humans have the ability to, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Humans have a prefrontal cortex, right? We can imagine future scenarios we can imagine the effects of our actions and so that helps us to think ahead and hopefully make good decisions right that's a good one um yeah the ability ability to think and choose from different options yeah so humans have the ability to hold multiple thoughts in their head at the same time and choose the best of those right we don't simply rely on um our instincts and what our bodies are telling us, um, as many animals do. Um, yeah, Michael says, yeah, we use our brain to invent technology. Um, that's something that is almost exclusively human, right? Not just to use tools, but to create new ones. Um, of the very few animals that actually use tools, um, very little work goes into actually creating the tool. Um, one animal that uses tools are chimpanzees and often they'll use a stick and they'll take all the branches off the stick, they'll take all the leaves off and then they'll put it into um, a mound to get termites out. And so the termites will attack the stick, the chimpanzee will pull the stick out of the hole and then the chimpanzee will eat the termites. Um, so it's a very simple tool, uh, but of course humans uh, invent some very complicated tools, right? Um, uh, Aliana says humans are different due to them being in control of the earth. Um, yeah, humans have, humans have a very significant impact on their environment, right? All animals do, right? Uh, any animal that lives in an environment will have an it have some influence on the environment itself right they'll have some impact on it um, but humans have uh, the unique and maybe problematic uh, ability to completely modify their environments to suit themselves right and so 
I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think I'm right that most of us are right now sitting in an, in an environment that's human constructed, right? I'm sure most of you aren't sitting, you know, out in a field or under a tree somewhere. I assume most of you are sitting in a house or in an apartment, right? And those are environments that humans create for themselves. Um, yeah, and so we create environments, we modify the environment to suit our wants and our needs, and problematically, we are also capable of destroying the environment in which we live in, which uh, I think many of us would agree we're in the process of doing at the moment. Um, uh, evolution in time, Lily says, yeah, um, humans are unique because of the process of evolution that they have undergone, right? And so all living creatures on the planet have been subjected to evolution, and that's kind of why they are the way they are. Uh, and so we're the product of our own evolution. And we'll try to talk about that a little bit. I don't want to go into a huge amount of detail. Um, actually, that's not true. I do want to go into a bunch of detail, uh, but it's not really within the scope of what we want to talk about in this class. And so I probably won't go into too much uh, detail on human evolution, but it's a fascinating story and I'd, I'd love to be able to spend more time on it. Um, but yeah, Lily, we're, we're the product of our, of our own evolution. Um, Casey says the ability to communicate using words and symbols and body gestures and facial expressions. Yeah, all that's true. Um, us humans have a very complicated way of communicating with each other. Um, most animals can communicate through body language or through sound, but the things that they can communicate to each other are pretty basic, right? Um, you know, come here, go away, I found food, I'm looking for a mate, you know, very simple messages that animals can communicate to each other. Um, but of course, humans can anything a human can think, they can communicate to other humans, right? And we do it through using our voices. We do it um, through sound. We do it in many cases through writing. We can write things down. Um, we can use our facial expressions. We can use gestures with our bodies. All of these things are modes of communication that humans use. And yeah, humans communicate with each other far more than any other species does. And of course we do it in a number of different ways. So yeah, that's very true. Uh, Manish, good morning. Um, social organization, yeah, we have, we are social creatures, right? Humans are social beings. We don't naturally, you know, go off in the mountains and live by ourselves for most of our lives. That's not really what we are. We are animals that like to live in groups and we're animals um, that sort of have to organize ourselves so that we can work in groups as well. Yeah, all of that stuff is, um, all that stuff is good. Um, so those are in fact all ways in which, um, you could answer the question, what, what's a human? How do you describe a human? And the reason I asked you that question to begin with is because parts of this course will be informed by the discipline of anthropology. Uh, and anthropology, if you don't know, is the study of human beings as biological and cultural and social beings. And so basically that is the question that anthropologists are trying to ask. No matter what kind of anthropologist you're talking to, no matter what their research area is, all of them are trying to answer the question that you just answered, the question of what, what is a human? What does it mean to be a human? What are humans like? So anthropologist studies humans in all times and all places. And like I said, as biological and social and cultural beings. And of course, we, uh, anthropologists study them in the present and in the past. Um, as a bit of an aside, this is not um, super important, but my original university degrees were in 
uh, were in anthropology. And so I spent a lot of time taking, or a lot of time taking anthropology classes, uh, and I did a master's in anthropology. And so this is kind of, in some ways, this is kind of my home base in terms of um, what I've studied. But anyway, that's that's aside. Um, so if you think about anthropology as the study of human beings everywhere, in all times and all places, in the present and in the past, um, I think you could probably imagine that that's a huge amount of things to study, right? How can you possibly go about studying and describing all humans everywhere, you know, in the past and the present? It's way, way too much, right? It's a huge field of study. And so most anthropologists, uh, or most of the time, anthropology is broken into four broad fields, okay, that sort of specialize in certain aspects of the study of humans. So I'll just walk you through a couple of these here, just so you're, you're aware. Um, the first one is biological anthropology. And so biological anthropologists, sometimes called physical anthropologists, um, these scientists study humans as biological organisms. And so physical anthropologists or biological anthropologists are interested in how our bodies worked, uh, work, sorry. Um, they're interested in how we evolved as human, as creatures, as biological creatures. Um, they're interested in how we think about our physical body, um, how our bodies work, how our bodies are injured, um, what kind of medicines we use in our, on our bodies. All of those things are within the realm of um, biological or physical anthropology. And so, again, this extends all the way back to the first humans. And so paleoanthropologists, um, if you know your Latin, paleo means old, anthro means man or human, and logos, actually, no, sorry, that's Greek. Um, uh, logos is kind of the way. So it's the way of ancient people. Uh, paleoanthropologists study things like human evolution. And so here on the screen, you'll see um, a collection of somewhat odd looking creatures. Um, these are all primates, which we are, of course. These are all primates that have come before us. All of them walked on two feet, just like we do. Um, most of them used tools, just like we do. Um, some of them were smarter than others. Uh, some of them are probably our ancient, ancient ancestors, and some of them are not. Um, but examining the, the skeletal remains of these animals and trying to figure out our family tree before humans evolved is something that um, a physical anthropologist or a, bio a biological anthropologist would, uh, would do. And again, this is a fascinating story of um, what these creatures were like and how they evolved. Um, we don't have a ton of time to, to deal with that, unfortunately, but it's a really interesting area of, um, of anthropology. Some biological anthropologists are primatologists. And so, like I mentioned, um, human beings are primates, right? We are apes, unfortunately. Um, hopefully nobody's offended by that. Uh, I'm an ape too, if it makes you feel any better. Um, but all of us are primates, all of us are apes. And so some anthropologists use comparisons with our closest relatives to try to understand a little bit about what we are. And so um, here we have uh, a very famous scientist who you, you may recognize her name or not, uh, but this is Jane Goodall. Uh, and Jane uh, did a lot of scientific research um, in Africa with chimpanzees. And here she's Looks like she's making friends with a cute little chimpanzee there. Chimpanzees are our closest living relative. They're the closest thing to us on the planet. And so um, many studies have been conducted on chimpanzees to see if anything we learn about chimpanzees can actually tell us a little bit about what we're like as well. Um, 
biological anthropologists have also not only no, le, le, sorry my can't talk this morning um, have not only examined our physical bodies but also our bodies in terms of our genetics and so this is a much more recent field of study right we've only been able to properly sequence genomes for um, a couple of decades now um, but one of the things that biological anthropologists used genetic data for was to figure out how human populations are related to, e to each other. And so human beings, homo sapiens, us uh, as a species, um, our species seems to have evolved in Eastern Africa. And so if you look on the screen, you can see um, all of these lines that are on the map kind of start out in East Africa, where we think the very first humans, the very first homo sapiens appeared, evolved. Um, but of course, over time, we spread out over the entire globe and humans came to live on every continent. And so um, using genetic data, biological anthropologists were able to determine um, just when that happened, when, when humans started to leave Africa, where they went, um, and sort of by what time they arrived in certain parts of the world. Uh, and so obviously as the science continues to improve, um, more and more genetic studies are, are done to try to, again, understand who we are as, as creatures. Um, the second sort of broad subfield of anthropology is archaeology. And archaeologists study material remains. So they study what's left behind in order to try to figure out what kind of cultural behavior humans were doing in the past. And so archaeologists will often work in uh, very muddy situations like this. You can see some archaeologists here are in, um, are in a park where people seem to have been doing some sort of activity in the past and they're digging up what's left. Um, unfortunately for archaeologists, most of what they find is actually garbage, right? Because garbage is what human beings leave behind most often. But if you think about it, even though that doesn't sound very romantic and very exciting, I think you can imagine that if you went through someone's garbage, you would have a pretty good idea of what their life was like, right? You would know the kind of foods that they ate. You would know the kind of products that they bought. Um, you might have some idea of the kind of activities that they like to engage in. You could learn all kinds of things about someone based on their garbage, right? Based on what they leave behind. And so archaeologists are constantly doing this sort of thing, digging up the remains of past people examining the things that they leave behind and then trying to say something about what their lives were like and what kind of things that they were doing. Um, and so sometimes, well, in, in many cases, archaeologists are in the process of digging up stuff like this. Sometimes archaeologists are able to um, excavate human remains as well. Um, this kind of depends on where in the world you live. Um, sometimes you're allowed to do this and sometimes you're not. Um, but in places where you are allowed to do this, um, a huge amount of information can be determined based on human skeletons, right? So here, if we look at this picture on the screen, we could learn things about not only a people's burial customs, so how they bury their um, how they bury their dead people, but we could also learn a little bit about their technology. We could learn about their health. We could learn about the foods that they ate by doing um, chemical analyses of their bones. Um, there's a huge wealth of knowledge that can be um, that can be collected from uh, human burials like this. So oftentimes archaeologists are looking through the stuff that people leave behind. In many, many cases, that's kind of their garbage, which again is not very, um, seems not very exciting. Um, but sometimes you can actually excavate the remains of people themselves. And again, there's all kinds of things you can learn about people's behavior in the past based on uh, human remains, based on skeletons. 
The third field of anthropology is something called linguistic anthropology. And so linguistic anthropologists study human language, how language works, uh, how it is constructed, how people use it, um, and how it allows us to transmit our culture and our knowledge from one generation to the next. Um, and again, maybe that's something we should have mentioned when we were talking about what a human was, because that's an important thing too, is that we are able to transmit our knowledge through generations, right? Most animals aren't able to, aren't able to do this in any meaningful way, but because of our ability to use language, we can transmit this knowledge, right? Um, maybe a more, <clears throat> maybe a, a, a way in which linguistics uh, might be more familiar to you is many movies and television shows are starting to really get into this, the idea of creating actual foreign languages. And so sometimes this happens in sort of sci-fi or um, sort of space themed shows or movies. Um, Game of Thrones was uh, kind of an obvious example of this where they used the principles of linguistics to create, uh, I think, two or three brand new languages. And so, again, if you know how a language works, then you can basically build your own. And so um, Game of Thrones, if, you, if anyone ever watched it, um, they hired a linguist to create three specific languages for the characters in this um, in this show and those languages are real they work just like real languages the only difference is they didn't appear on their own or sort of evolve over hundreds or thousands of years they were created in a short period of time and on purpose but they work just like regular languages just like regular languages do. Um, so the entertainment world aside, though, um, linguistic anthropologists can also use um, can also use their linguistic methods to determine how languages are related to one another. And so here you can see what linguistic anthropologists had done um, was to take modern languages and some not quite so modern languages, and compare them to each other. And so what they did was they examined how languages were created. Um, they examined how, um, how words were constructed and which words were similar and which words were different in order to figure out how languages are related to each other, how languages evolve. And so this is something here this sort of language family tree, if you will, uh, that linguistic anthropologists were able to put together based on systematically comparing how languages are built and, and what words are similar and different. And so you can see here that at some point in the distant past, and we don't quite know when, but at some point in the distant past, there was a language um, that linguists are calling Proto-Indo-European. And so we don't really know what this language was like. Certainly nobody has spoken it for thousands and thousands of years. But based on the similarities found in all of these modern languages, we know that they're all related to each other, right? And so you can see that uh, at the bottom of this diagram here, there's an Iranian branch. And so Persian languages are one branch of this tree. Um, there's an Indic branch, which starts out with Sanskrit, but um, other languages uh, spoken in sort of South Asia actually evolve from this language here. You can see there's a Slavic branch. And so all of the sort of Eastern European languages that you might be familiar with have evolved from that as well. And so it's kind of interesting because you wouldn't think that a language like Punjabi and Russian would be related to each other. But as it turns out, they actually are. Um, they are part of the same language family tree that goes back thousands and thousands of years to this Proto-Indo-European language. 
again, nobody speaks it and nobody has for thousands and thousands of years, but based on the relationships between all of these other languages, we know that it must have, it must have existed. Okay, and the last subfield of anthropology is called sociocultural or cultural anthropology. And we'll probably be spending most of our time um, talking about anthropological concepts that fit within this subfield. Um, okay, that's partly true. Um, sociocultural anthropology is the study of human behavior in contemporary cultures. And so by contemporary, I mean cultures that an anthropologist could actually go and visit. And so one of the first anthropologists that were um, part of, I guess, the modern tradition um, is this guy here. I'm sure, I'm sure you can't guess which, which one is the anthropologist. Um, but the anthropologist in this picture is Branislaw Malinowski. And Branislaw was... Um, he was an anthropologist in the early 1900s. Um, he has kind of a funny story in that he was um, he was in New Guinea when uh, World War I broke out and he kind of got stuck. Um, he was a citizen of uh, Austria-Hungary and because the British were in charge of New Guinea at the time, he wasn't really allowed to go back home during World War I. He was stuck in New Guinea. And so <clears throat> while he was there, he decided to study um, these people living in islands very close to New Guinea called the Trobrian Islands. And so Branislaw Malinowski here lived with the Trobrian Islanders for uh, a year, a few years during World War I, and basically tried to document and understand their culture. Prior to Branislaw Malinowski, uh, anthropologists kind of felt that they could understand culture by reading sort of the diaries and the accounts of explorers. And so anthropologists would sit in their nice comfy chairs at home and read the accounts and the diaries of explorers, and they would analyze foreign cultures based on that. And um, a new generation of anthropologists in the late 1800s and the early 1900s said, no, that's crazy. You can't understand a culture by sitting in your, you know, soft leather chair at home. You actually have to go to the culture. You also, you have to visit them and live in their houses and eat their food and learn to speak their language and so that you can ask them questions about why they're doing what they're doing and what they believe and why. And so, Branislaw Malinowski here is um, was one of this sort of newer breed of anthropologists that felt that it was important to go and try to become part of a culture in order to understand it. You had to understand it from the inside, not from the outside. Uh, and of course, that's still the way that sociocultural anthropologists operate today. Uh, so here is sort of a modern anthropologist. Um, I don't know her name, unfortunately, but she's doing the same thing as Branislaw Malinowski did. She's sitting with these women. I'm sure she's learned to speak their language. They're having a little bit of lunch, it looks like. And she's going to sort of learn about their culture from the inside, right? She's going to make friends with them and ask them about why they believe the things that they believe. Okay. Now, as I mentioned earlier, actually, I'm going to hit pause for 20 seconds here. How are we doing? Is everybody, is everybody good? Does everyone have, does anyone have any questions right now? Maybe just give me a thumbs up in the live chat if it, if you're good, or if you have any questions or concerns or complaints. Everybody good? So much is good, good, everyone's all right? Okay. Very good, very good. I got 
two thumbs up there. Awesome, awesome. Nish is good. Carmen's good. Okay. Awesome. No cues. Good, good, good. All right. <clears throat> okay. So, like I mentioned at the beginning, anthropologists are all about trying to understand what a human being is, how human beings work. And culture is an important part of this. And the reason why culture is so important to anthropologists in the study of humans is because of the way that we have evolved and the way we kind of um, conduct our lives. If you're trying to understand what it is to be human, the problem with humans is that we are born with very little in the way of pre-programmed behavior, okay? Um, the way I like to think about human babies, hopefully this won't disturb you, um, the way I like to think about human babies is they're kind of like computers, but they're computers with no operating system. So imagine if you can, and most of us have probably never seen such a thing unless we're really into computers, but imagine if you will your computer or your laptop um, or your phone or your iPad or whatever, imagine it with no operating system installed. So imagine your laptop with no Windows installed or your um, Mac with no OS X or OS X installed. You probably have never seen such a thing. And the reason, of course, that you've probably never seen it is because a computer with no operating system doesn't know how to do anything really. Uh, unless you are a computer programmer who can sort of manipulate it with code, an operating system tells a computer how to do things, right? It tells when I install OS X on my laptop here, the operating system tells my computer how to go on the internet. It tells it how to check emails. It, te it tells it how to find YouTube and watch YouTube videos. It tells it how to broadcast a live stream, right? All of that is because of the operating system. Without that operating system, the computer is not that useful, right? It doesn't really know how to do anything. And human beings can be thought about in the same way. Um, humans have very sophisticated behavioral systems that are like an operating system of a computer, but we're not born with any of that software already installed. Um, most of our brain development happens after we're born, not before. And so when little babies like this cutie pie here, when he's born or she, I'm not sure, um, when they're born, they don't have an operating system installed. They don't know how to do anything, right? They can't feed themselves. They can't take care of themselves. They won't be able to walk for about a year. They are very limited in their ability to understand the world or to take care of their own needs, right? They need to be taught everything, right? Everything needs to be taught to this little child. And so because very little of human behavior is sort of pre-wired into us, basically everything needs to be taught. And the process of being taught that, um, the, the process of humans downloading their their operating system, if you will, that process is called enculturation. And all of us have been through this process um, in the cultures that we live in. We've learned our cultural beliefs, we've learned values, we've learned norms. So what kind of customs and behaviors and ways of being are normal and accepted and which ones aren't. Sometimes we've learned morals, right? Things that are we should do or that we shouldn't do. Um, sometimes we've learned a, a religious tradition and sometimes we haven't. All of these things are part of our operating system. Um, and so we've all been subjected to this, right? We've all downloaded or are in the process of downloading our own software. Um, 
we should remember that this is not a voluntary process, right? So we haven't, none of us have chosen to do this. We've all been given our culture based on the country and the family into which we were born, right? And so we've learned whatever culture our parents belong to. Um, and so because of this, because of the idea that human infants are born with really no, very, very little innate programming, and basically everything is taught to us, that means that everything a human does is a cultural behavior. Um, to be a human, a living human, is to be a practitioner of culture. And so often when we think about cultural behaviors, we think about maybe the more obvious stuff. And so we might think about food or clothing or celebrations or artwork or religious practices. That's commonly what we think of when we think of cultural behavior. But really, we should think about everything as cultural behavior. Um, I got up this morning and I brushed my teeth. And most of us wouldn't think of teeth brushing as a cultural behavior, but it is, right? I don't, I don't do that naturally. I don't do it because it's my human instinct to brush my teeth. I do it because I've been taught to do it, right? I've been taught to take care of my teeth. I've been taught that if I don't brush my teeth, my breath will stink and people won't want to talk to me. Not that that's a problem right now, but in, you know, regular life. Um, I would brush my teeth for those reasons. And so my tooth brushing and your tooth brushing as well, those are cultural behaviors. And so really everything we do uh, and most of what we think can be seen as cultural because we've been taught to do it. Whew, okay, so normally in Normally in uh, regular class, I give us a little break in between just so we can stretch our legs and go to the bathroom and stuff like that. So maybe what I'll do is I'll give you a 10 minute break like I normally would. Uh, I'll put a little timer here on the screen and we'll take a break. We can, you know, have a bathroom break, stretch your legs, get some food, do whatever you need to do, and then we'll start back in about 10 minutes okay I'm sure that sounds good I'm sure nobody will disagree so uh, I'll see you back here shortly okay
Okay, and we're back. So, <laughs> so um, where we are. So this class is about comparative culture, right? We're looking at um, um, we're, we're, we're going to be looking at different cultures and cultures are something that anthropologists study. And so a lot of the things that we will be dealing with are things that have been researched by anthropology and anthropology can, um, <clears throat> anthropology is highly concerned with human culture. And why is that? Well, again, because culture patterns, basically everything that humans do. Um, humans have very little in the way of innate biological programming. And so anything that you see humans out doing, unless it's the very basic, you know, eating or sleeping, um, can be considered a cultural act. And so um, it's important for us to understand what culture is, because that's how we're going to understand how humans behave. Um, all right, so let me just go back here. Right, so to be a living human is to be a practitioner of culture, okay? Um, within a culture, we have all kinds of different beliefs and values and behaviors. Um, Clifford Geertz, who is a, an anthropologist, he says that humans are incomplete or unfinished animals that complete themselves through culture. And I think this is very similar to the metaphor or the analogy that we used with the computer and the software, right? Um, a computer completes itself by downloading an operating system, right? That's what teaches it how to do all the things that a computer can do. And similarly, humans are the same thing. We complete ourselves with our own operating system and our operating system is, is culture. And so at the very basic level, this is what we'll say culture is, okay? We'll say that it is a system. So it is something that has a bunch of different parts that operate together as a whole. We'll say that it's a system uh, of shared beliefs. So these are things that we, within a culture, we all share. Shared beliefs and values and customs and behaviors and artifacts. And artifacts are physical objects, okay? All of these are common to members of a single society. That's what we'll say culture is. It's this system of beliefs and values and behaviors that we all share, okay? Now, <clears throat> for those of you in social justice, you just saw this, um, you just saw this graphic in a slightly different context, but this is a good summary or um, representation of some of the things that a culture is. And so here in the diagram, we have kind of an iceberg metaphor. And often the thing they say about icebergs is that most of it is below the surface. And the idea here is that it's the same thing with culture. Some of the things that we identify with human cultures are just things that are on the surface, but there's far more that we don't see. And so when we think about our own culture or when we think about um, a culture that's foreign to us, often we think about the superficial things, the things that are on the surface. We think about people's food, people's style of dress, people's language, um, perhaps the religious celebrations they engage in, maybe their art or their music. Those are kind of the obvious um, outside indicators of a culture, but there's far more below the surface. Um, there's far more in terms of things that we don't see. And these are the beliefs that a culture holds, the ideologies that they um, ascribe to, the values they have, um, the way that in which a culture thinks that the world works. 
Um, all of these, again, are below the surface. They're not obvious to people outside the culture. Uh, and sometimes they're kind of so deep that they're not even obvious to people within the culture. Uh, people absorb some of these messages subconsciously. They don't really realize that they're being taught um, certain ideas. And so if you look at this diagram here on the screen, you'll see that there are, just below the surface, there are some cultural beliefs about, say, courtesy or personal space. And so I often do this in class when we're together, but obviously we'll have to imagine it this time. Um, imagine that you, you're sort of out in the street, maybe you're going to school, maybe you're going to a friend's house, whatever, and you bump into someone who you kind of know, like you've met them before, they're not a close friend or a family member, they're, they're just someone you know. Now, you might talk to them for a minute or two, uh, but you will instinctively stand a certain distance away from that person, right? You'll, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's a meter or so apart, maybe it's a little less, maybe it's a little more, uh, but you will have this kind of <clears throat> instinct about how far away to stand from that person, okay? And if you imagine if that person took a step towards you, you would probably feel a little uncomfortable, right? You might feel, okay, this is a little too close. If they took another step toward you, you might back up a little bit instinctively. On the other hand, if the person was standing a little too far away from you, you might instinctively think that that's kind of strange, or you might think in the back of your mind, why are they standing so far away? This is kind of odd. Um, and what's going on there is that we have, we all have absorbed ideas of personal space, right? So with someone who we kind of know, but is not our friend, we have kind of an instinctive feel for how close we will allow them to get, right? And if somebody comes into our personal space, it makes us feel uncomfortable, right? It makes us feel like backing off. And again, if someone is too far away, it also feels odd, right? It makes us question why, why is this person standing, you know, four meters away from me when we're talking? What's going on? Um, and so what's interesting about that is we all have that instinct, right? We all know the distance that we should stand away from someone who we don't really know very well. We all have sort of a comfort zone. But if you think about it, I would be very surprised to hear anyone say that someone had taught them how far away to stand from someone. Nobody taught you and nobody taught me. We all simply figured it out, right? We absorbed messages about how close to stand to people. And so, that's one of those cultural rules that we are taught, yet we're not really taught directly. We don't really understand or remember when we came to know that this is how far I should stand away from this person. Uh, but yet, when someone breaks that rule, when someone violates that cultural norm, you know it, right? If somebody is standing too close to you, if they're standing in your personal space, it makes you feel uncomfortable, right? You know something is is wrong. Uh, and of course, the deeper that you go into culture, um, often the less aware people are that they have been taught this cultural lesson or that they've uh, been taught this cultural belief, um, but also the stronger their emotional reaction to it. And so, um, but regardless, when we think about culture, we can think about those surface things like language and um, style of dress and music and things like that. But we should also remember that there's far more to a culture below the surface. And a lot of that has to do with 
ideas and values and ways of looking at the world. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> culture functions for humans as not only as their operating system, but as a tool that they use to interact with their environment. And so, again, us humans don't have really any strong instincts about how to live in the world. When we're born, we don't know how to eat or take care of ourselves. And so culture teaches us how to connect and interact with our physical environment. So it teaches us how to find food. It teaches us how to shelter ourselves from the elements and from the weather. Um, it teaches us how to stay warm and stay dry. It teaches us how to be safe, right? We, we all live in a somewhat dangerous world, whether we're talking about the modern world or whether we're talking about the world of thousand, thousands of years ago. And culture teaches us how to keep ourselves safe. But it also teaches us how to interact with one another. Um, and maybe, maybe I will ask you this question here. Um, if we say that culture is something, is a, a system of beliefs and values and so on that we all share together as a group, my question would be, why would we why would we choose to adopt a common set of beliefs? I mean, why is it important that everyone in a certain culture basically believes the same thing? Why can't we just all believe whatever we want? Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Maybe throw some answers or some thoughts into uh, the live chat there in terms of why you think it might be important for people within a certain culture to basically believe, to hold a lot of the same beliefs, to have a lot of the same values. Why might people, why might that be important for people? What do you think? Um, Ella says less conflict. Yeah, so if we all agree on, well, let's let's hear some more. I, there's, there, I wanna I wanna talk about that, Ella, but I just wanna see if some some more people add to that. Um, let's see. Why would people? Why do you think it's important for people to all believe the same thing? Uh, okay, unified thoughts, they're following their family's beliefs. Okay, so uh, Aliana, that's definitely true, right? We, um, because we download most of our cultural software from our parents, um, often our beliefs are very similar to our parents, right? Not all of them, of course, right? We all are unique individuals with our own minds, and so I think we can all <clears throat> think of ways in which we agree with the values and beliefs of our parents, but also ways in which we disagree with them. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we definitely inherit those beliefs from our families. And so uh, often it's, they're similar. Um, are we kind of hive minded? Yeah, that's yes and no. Um, we are no, I don't know. I'm not sure what it has to do with monkeys, but um, let, let's put let's stitch some of these together here. So we've got the hive mind thing. We've got more understanding, more unity, um, unified thought. We've got less conflict. Um, I think all of those things are connected, and I think the way in which they're connected is in the idea of cooperation. Um, we've already mentioned that humans are, um, we've already mentioned that humans are social animals, right? We, we live together in groups, 
But it's also, um, it's also important to remember that being in social groups requires us to cooperate. It requires us to work together as a group. Um, we are all individuals that have our own drives, right? There's all, we all have our own wants and needs and things that we want to have happen for us. But if everyone acted selfishly, if everyone just went out and did whatever they wanted because they wanted to do it, we wouldn't be able to live in groups, right? There would be, like you've mentioned, there would be all kinds of conflict. Um, uh, and, and racism and ethnic conflicts are just one type of conflict, Casey, but, um, but you're very right, I think. Um, yeah, so if, if everyone just kind of had their own values and their own beliefs and did whatever they wanted, we would have all kinds of conflict because <clears throat> because everyone would just want to do what they want to do, right? And so culture gives us a set of common rules and beliefs so that we can live together as a group and so that we can cooperate. Um, I might be getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but if you think back, if you imagine when our species was still evolving, um, we had a bunch of um, we had a bunch of bipedal primates, and so we had these kind of ape-like creatures running around Africa on two feet. Um, this is millions of years ago, by the way, <clears throat> millions of years ago. Um, but these animals weren't very remarkable. Um, they weren't very fast runners. They were certainly less fast than we are, and even we are not very fast runners in the animal kingdom. Um, they weren't very smart. They weren't really any smarter than your average ape. Uh, and so millions of years ago, we had these rather slow, not so intelligent bipedal primates running around Africa. And of course, the question is, of course, how did they, how did they survive with very little intelligence, very little in the way of tools or technology, um, limited ability to run away. How do these animals survive? Well, they survive by cooperating with each other. That's their major adaptation. They live in groups and they work together. And so culture is what allows us to, um, to do that. The other thing we could say about human cooperation is that it is rather unique in that humans are basically the only species that is able to cooperate very flexibly and to do so in large numbers okay and so if you think about it there are a number of different kinds of animals that can cooperate in a flexible way if you think about a pack of wolves you have 20 or 25 wolves and they sort of live in a group together they cooperate when they hunt. They figure out a way to ambush this deer or elk that they're trying to bring down. If the elk runs in an odd direction, the wolves are able to adjust their strategy in order to, um, to hunt the elk. Um, they're flexible. <clears throat> wolves also have a social structure, right? You'll probably know there's an alpha wolf, right? There's a wolf that's in charge of um, the wolf pack. And that can change, right? Some wolves can become more powerful or less powerful within their social hierarchy. And so wolves are uh, animals that are capable of cooperating in a very flexible way, but they can't really cooperate in large numbers. And one of the reasons for this is that <clears throat> their brains are, there's a real limit to how many individuals they can keep track of and cooperate with. And so most animals like this, they have a limit of maybe 20 or 30 animals. And after that, their social structures become too complicated and the animals can't keep track of them. And so if you have a wolf pack that grows too big, they'll actually split into two packs because again, they, um, they can't really cooperate in such a flexible way in large numbers. There's other animals in, on the planet that can cooperate very well in large numbers, but not flexibly. 
right? So if you think of a hive of bees, for instance, um, those bees, there may be hundreds and hundreds of bees or even thousands of bees within a hive. And all of them cooperate in, in a way that sort of allows the hive to continue to survive. But if you think about it, their cooperation is not flexible, right? There are different types of bees. There's worker bees and drones, and there's a queen bee. All the bees have their specific job, and the bees kind of go about doing their specific job in a particular way. And there's really no flexibility that's um, possible within a beehive, right? The, the bees have a queen, but no beehive has ever overthrown their queen and created a bee democracy where all the bees voted on what they wanted to do, right? That's, that's never happened. Um, because bees, while they can cooperate flex, uh, in large numbers, they cannot cooperate in a flexible way. Humans have the ability to do both of those things, right? We can cooperate in a flexible way and we can cooperate in very large numbers um, <clears throat> to the point where it can even be in the millions. And so if you think about Canada, for instance, Canada is a country with about 36 million people. And in a way, we're all cooperating together, right? We don't we don't all know each other. I don't know. We don't know 36 million people. We don't know what anyone else is doing, but we are all cooperating in a way that allows the country to function, right? So even us humans here in Canada can, 36 million of us can cooperate in a flexible, in a flexible way, right? And that's something that just animals can't really, can't really do. Um, and this is probably, well, probably, this has undoubtedly been one of the keys to the success of human beings is the ability to work together and to do it in a flexible way and to do it in large numbers. And culture is the key to that, right? Culture is what allows us to balance the needs, our individual needs and wants with the needs and wants of the group. And it identifies the goals that we should be working for and how we work toward those goals. So culture is a very important part of the success story of human beings. We wouldn't really be able to do what we do without it. Um, I wanted to, this is actually connected. Uh, uh, Albert, I waited to address your comment here because I knew this was coming. Um, you said here that it gives uh, it gives meaning to our lives. Culture gives meaning to our lives. And you're very right. Um, that's one of the things that <clears throat> makes humans unique as well, is that humans have this kind of innate desire to have this innate desire to give meaning to their lives and to their experiences. And so again, my, my cat who is now asleep, she doesn't feel the need to give any meaning to her, her life, right? She kind of lives her life here with me. She asks for what she wants. She does what she wants, but she's not really trying to give any meaning to her existence. Um, as far as we're aware, this is something that is uniquely human. Only humans need to give meaning to their existence. And so again, Clifford Geertz here says that this desire to give meaning to our experiences is something that human beings are compelled to do, right? And if we didn't do that, Geertz feels that our, our lives would make no sense, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't know why humans, other humans interacted with us the way that they do. We wouldn't know, you know, why it was bright sometimes and then it was really dark at other times and Sometimes water falls from the sky and we wouldn't really know what that meant either. And um, Geertz feels that without giving meaning to our experiences, our, our lives would be a confusing jumble of emotion and experience that wouldn't really make any sense. And humans, for some reason, have this desire to understand, right? To give meaning to things and to have things make sense. Yeah, and to find 
to find purpose, right? That's, that's something that is uniquely human as well, right? Uh, and, and probably something that we still don't understand, right? That, um, that desire to give meaning to things, that desire to find purpose, uh, and those things are connected to the idea of consciousness as well, which we also don't understand very well. Um, so, you know, in, in trying to understand where culture comes from and why we do what we do, um, I think you pretty quickly get into a place where <clears throat> we're not really sure why we are the way we are, right? We're not sure what consciousness is. We're not sure why humans want to give meaning to their experiences in a way that most animals don't seem to need don't seem to need to do um, what's interesting of course is that if you think of all societies around the world so wherever human cultures do exist or have existed um, wherever you live on the planet i think we could probably agree that most humans experience many of the same events in their lives, right? We are all um, present for the birth of children, right? We ourselves were born, of course, but uh, we have brothers and sisters who were born. Eventually we may have spouses who give birth or we may give birth ourselves. People around us die. We are all engaged in the desire to find food, right? We all need to find food. We all need water. We all need shelter. So we have these, no matter where we live in the world and no matter what culture we belong to, we have these experiences that are just common to being human, right? If you're human, you experience these things. But my question for you then is, if being human means that you experience a lot of the same things, not all the same things, but a lot of the same things. My question is, why do you think we have so many cultures? Even if you just think about one thing, um, even if you think about birth, let's say, where do babies come from? Um, I'm hoping that we all know where babies come from at this point, but if you look at cultural explanations for where babies come from and how they're born, you'll hear all kinds of different stories. Um, you'll hear all kinds of different explanations for how women become pregnant and how childbirth occurs. And so my question is, if all humans give birth the same way, which we basically do, why are there so many different explanations for the same thing? Why do different cultures explain the process of pregnancy and childbirth differently? Or if you want to think about death, why do we have so many different explanations for what happens when you die? Right? All, <clears throat> all humans experience death, either for themselves or within their community. But why do, we, why do we explain birth and death and other things differently in different cultures? What do you think about that? What do you think about that? I'll give you a minute. I know I'm I know I'm really putting you on the spot with the big questions here this morning, but It is a tough question. I'll give you that. It's a tough one. Uh, because every okay, uh, Eliana, uh, Eliana says because everyone has their own theory and not everyone would agree with other theories. It's true, right? Um, <clears throat> again, different cultures have sometimes slightly and sometimes radically different ideas about things like birth and and death, right? And sometimes even 
even within a culture, we have different stories, right? There are, you know, if you're, you know, 18 or 20 years old, your culture will explain pregnancy to you one way. But if you're seven years old, we will give you a different story, right? Moms and dads will not tell, you know, their, sometimes their children where babies come from in the accurate way. They'll have a different way of explaining it. Um, so between cultures, we have different explanations, but sometimes even within a culture, we will have different explanations depending on who we're talking to, right? Um, let's see, a way to comfort someone. Yeah, so we might explain, we might explain things differently based on situations, right? Based on comfort. And so if someone is about to die, we might want to give them an explanation that is comforting, right? That will, um, that will sort of alleviate their, their fears, right? Yeah, that's part of it. Let's see here. This is a complicated, this is a complicated question. And the reasons why is that um, people create meaning in all kinds of different and complicated ways. Um, it's not, it's not a, there's not one answer to this question and it's not a simple answer to this question. So uh, Aliana and Sarvesh, what you, what you said is correct. Um, but there's also a lot of other factors too. Um, <clears throat> if you think about the story of birth, of human births and how women become pregnant, the environment often has a lot to do with it. Um, a lot of agricultural societies, so societies that, um, grow their own food that use farming. Um, often you'll hear, I'm just going to stop here. Uh, Manish says beliefs and understanding work differently for different people. So they make different explanations. Um, that's true. That, that is also true. Um, yes. So the, if you live in a farming community or a culture that uses farming, often the way that pregnancy and birth is described is with a farming metaphor or a farming analogy. And so I don't know if any of you have heard this, but here in sort of Western cultures, traditionally there is language around a woman as being fertile, right? She's fertile, like the soil is fertile, like the ground is fertile. And a woman becoming pregnant, they'll talk about a seed, right? A seed is being planted. And so in some agricultural communities, in some farming cultures, pregnancy is understood through the metaphor of farming. And so you'll hear things about fertility. Um, you'll hear things about seeds being planted when a woman becomes pregnant. You'll hear um, if a woman is unable to get pregnant, you'll hear her described as barren, right? And barren is... Um, a farming term right for land that's not fertile and so environment can have something to do with how people um, with how people explain things um, the way in which people the environment people live in and the way that they acquire their food can inform the way they see things um, if any of you are Christian or if any of you have any experience with um, the Christian Bible, the, the, the Hebrew Bible or the, the, the Christian one, you'll often, hear, <clears throat> you'll often hear Jesus described as a shepherd, right? So he'll be described as a shepherd and the people that um, believe in Jesus or follow him are referred to as his sheep. And so there's this kind of... Um, shepherd sheep metaphor or analogy um, and this makes sense too because if you go back to the time of Jesus there are lots of people in the area of the world that he lived in um, getting their food that way um, they have flocks of sheep that they kind of um, look after and move around <clears throat> sorry I'm losing my voice here move around through the mountainside and so 
the fact that Jesus is described and understood as a shepherd and his followers are understood as sheep is very related to the environment and the way people were getting their food at that time of history. There were lots of shepherds and sheep roaming around. And so it's a very natural metaphor um, to happen. Sometimes historical events will inform people's um, people's understanding of the world. So if your culture has undergone um, hurricanes or typhoons or tidal waves or earthquakes or things like that or a volcanic eruption, um, those will sometimes be worked into your meaning of uh, how you understand the world. <clears throat> other parts of culture can interact with each other in order to inform explanations that are consistent within the culture. And so I guess the, the short answer here is that there is a pretty significant web of interacting things that help to describe why people explain things the way that they do. And so if you can imagine a culture living high in the Arctic where it's all snow and ice, they're going to have a totally different experience of the world than a culture that lives in the Amazon rainforest, right? These are two totally different ways of living. And so those people are going to interact with their environments differently. They're going to have different, <clears throat> different plant and animal communities that they're interacting with. Um, they're going to feed themselves differently. They're going to experience different natural phenomenon. And so all of those things are going to inform the way that they feel about the world and, and the way that they explain things that are not easily understood. Okay. All right. So I think it's a little bit early, but I think that might be a good place to stop. Um, we have more to talk about in terms of culture, uh, but I think we're, we're just at a natural kind of break point here. And um, <clears throat> again, because we're just getting back, my, my vocal muscles are still warming up. And so you can hear I'm, um, my vocal cords are kind of struggling a little bit. Um, after, usually after the first week, they're okay, but the first week is always tough on them. Um, so do you have anything to read? Um, eventually you will, Michael, but not not for today. Um, either today or, to, what well, not today, either tomorrow or Friday, I'll have some stuff for you to read. And I do want to use some video conferencing and get us talking to one another. Um, but again, I just wanted to lay some groundwork here for us. And if there's anyone else who kind of trickles into this class at the last minute, I don't want us to be sort of too far ahead. So I think with that, I'll probably leave it there for today. Um, as usual, if you have any questions or things you want to ask me, uh, email or Microsoft Teams and I will get back to you. Um, the slides that we saw will be available on student portal so you can see them again if you want to or i guess you can watch this again too because it'll be posted um but other than that i think i think that's all i i have for you today so maybe i will sign off it was nice um hearing from all of you and interacting with all of you today um and maybe we'll we'll get talking kind of face to face either tomorrow or on friday okay so um yeah, hope you have a great rest of the day. I'm going to let you go. And um, yeah, we'll talk to you soon or talk to you tomorrow. Okay, so bye.